and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church, and uh, glad to have you, and uh, tonight we're, uh, we're going live with my iPhone instead of the uh, other equipment, so uh, if it looks a little different, just stay with us and enjoy the service. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Jesus is Lord, and um, we are so excited to be together with the family of God. Hallelujah. We're talking about uh, the church and her mission. Last week, we talked about, number one, our mission is to evangelize. And then we talked about unifying around the doctrine of the church. And um, uh, I know that our, our plans are and or were to uh, start on the Bible and Light of Our Redemption next Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to cover all what we have to cover tonight. Uh, in one service, so it may be we have to take two more weeks with this and then uh, start on on the other. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll just see how it all goes. Hallelujah. The, um, the so the evangelism, unifying uh, of the saints around the doctrine of the church, and then number three, fellowship. And uh, let's just jump right on in here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, the church is, sustained, is a sustain, is to sustain a fellowship of believers. Uh, the early church was, was rich in fellowship. Um, and the Greek word that we get the, our term fellowship from is koinia, um, which means this. Here, here's what it means. It means that which they had in common. Um, and so... In Book of Acts, or, or they, they, they all had in common. They shared. They had communion. The passage in Acts um, defines fellowship, and, and all that the believers were together and had all things in common. Acts two forty four. Let's look there real quick. Acts two forty four. Hope you had a great day. Hope you're doing well, and uh, we're we're so glad to be together. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Acts 2 and 44. Uh, Hallelujah. And we could, we could back up again. Acts 2, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon, uh, uh, upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. Stole the possessions and good and parted them with all men as every man had need. And they continued daily uh, with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house <clears throat> and did eat their bread, um, their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Praise God. Okay, so, you know, when we talk about fellowship, oftentimes that's misunderstood. Uh, we get fellowship circles, fellowship halls, fellowship day. Um, usually social interaction and um, and all those those things are, are good and they are bonding things not quite carrying or conveying um, the the import of what the word really or what we're trying to say with the Bible um, the Bible word for fellowship is um, like we said koinia and the fellowship of, you know, is, is be used of the fellowship of ministering to the saints, not just hanging, you know, being buds and that kind of stuff, but actually ministering to the saints. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, a threefold cord is not easily broken. Um, giving that which every joint supplieth. So imparting one to another. Um, now, I'm not trying to be the, the the spiritual guru of the church, and you're the you're the most deepest one. This kind, of, we're just talk, we're actually talking about um, as as we are together, as we fellowship, we we are we we're, we're we're strengthening one another, we're building one another up, we're edifying one another, we're ministering one to the other, having all things in common, taking not necessarily you know um, communism that you know everybody's exactly the same, but we have the common Lord. We have, a, you know, there's one Lord, uh, one faith, one baptism, one God. Hallelujah. And we have a, the same, we are singleness of purpose. And it is our, uh, in fellowship in Koinonia, we, we work together and strive together. And we, we, we edify and we do not 
uh, try to supersede the others with our whatever, our spirituality. Um, we are um, endeavoring to lift them up and we go together and we do the work together. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, we see the ministry of the saints um, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 4. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians eight four, and the uh, you know, praying us much entreaty that we will receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, what, what in this case they were going to minister financial supply uh, to the saints, and that is part of Koinonia. Okay, they were we they were ministering financial supply, um, and and, and um, Galatians two nine. They gave the right, the right hand, as it said, they gave me to me the, and Barnabas, I'm sorry, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they were accepted uh, into the body or into that recognition by that body of as believers. And so they received the right hand of fellowship, ministering acceptance to them. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3.9 and, and the first part says, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, hallelujah, uh, that is of the participation in the body. You know how every, every uh, we being many are one body, hallelujah, glory to God. Uh, for your, and then Philippians 1, 5, for your fellowship in the gospel or participation in salvation, hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, in Philippians 2, 1, if any fellowship of the Spirit, in other words, unity in the body which has been uh, effected by the Holy Spirit. There's a unity that he brings about. And so, you know, participation, you know, so the unity of the Spirit. Um, in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse um, 3 and 6 and 7, John may summarize maybe a, a very clear aspect of uh, the biblical fellowship. Let's read here. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship, our common entity, amen, our, our oneness, uh, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If if we are walking in darkness and we say that we're that we're in that we have all things in common with him, then we're lying. Okay, why? Because he can't dark he walk can't walk in darkness. In him is light, and there is no darkness at all. So to say that I'm having fellowship with him, I'm having all things in common with him, and then walking in darkness is a lie. Doesn't mean you're lost and going to hell. It just means that you're you're not in walking in commonity. You're not walking in harmony um, with Him. Okay. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. Um, so fellowship is first of all a common relationship to the Father and the Son in the body of Christ, where we are united by the Spirit in the bonds of love, unity, singleness of purpose. The fellowship of believers extends to all mutual activities that are God-honoring, including dining together in the fellowship hall. Hallelujah. Uh, this came from, um, that, the, that last statement came from Foundations of Pentecostal Theology, um, page 432. And uh, published by Life Bible College. Hallelujah. All right. So let's look at some different scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 9. God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we had him common. We have shared. We have communion. Amen. 
Glory to God. And so we, here we are faithful and called unto the, amen, sharing, communion, and um, common with Jesus our Lord. Excuse me. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20. A little different for me tonight because using the iPhone to uh, broadcast with, I don't get to see the um, the comments and the and just stuff because I have no idea what kind of interaction I'm getting out there. Hallelujah. Here is, it talks about, uh, but I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship huh, with devils. You shouldn't share. You shouldn't be in common. It shouldn't be, um, you know, ha having that that where you're in common. You're you're com have things in common where you're having communion with, um, where you're sharing with devils. Uh, that's that's not a biblical thing for a believer. Where that's not what we do. We walk in a different place. We're to walk in fellowship with God. Hallelujah. Second uh, Corinthians six fourteen. And it states, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship, what commonness, what common ground? Are you here? Is there with righteousness and unrighteousness? And what communion? So you really kind of talking about the same thing. Remember it said fellowship meant to be in communion with, to have a shared experience with. What communion have light and darkness? Well, they don't. There's no fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness. There's no commonness. There's no sharing. There's no communion with light and darkness. They, they were opposed one to the other. Amen. Um, they're, 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 counsel, they're canceling. You know, you turn light out, darkness takes over. You turn light on, light, darkness uh, is, is overridden. Okay? And so there is no union or there's no koinonia between righteousness and unrighteousness. There's no communion between light and darkness. And so in, in the church, we are to be in fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, bound by the unity of the Spirit, and with one another. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 11. And have no fellowship, no koinonia, with the unfruitful dark, dark works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And I just sometimes wish people would, would get off of a um, overbearing narrative and um, where they, they take their narrative so far that it becomes silly. We can't ever say anything contrary to you. We, we only speak love over people because, you know, that God is love. He said, reprove. Reprove. The what? The unfruitful works of darkness. So you have to say something to reprove it. Now, we don't like to hear that. We All we want to hear is the, you know, zoos and wham whams. We want all the good stuff. We want it just be happy, happy, happy. We do disservice to people. Honestly, we do disservice to people when we just say, you're okay, I'm okay, hallelujah. Everybody's just hunkadory and it's all lovely. And we don't want to do anything to break your spirit. Listen, you know, as a parent, the Bible says that the rod of correction drives rebellion far from the heart of the child. He that spares the rod hates his child, not spare the rod, spoil the child. He who spares the rod hateth his child. Why? Because you're not directing them in the right direction. You're reinforcing behavior that is contrary to the things of God. And, you know, we are to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness, not have fellowship with it. Oh, there's, there's such a... 
a weird narrative out there that, you know, I can do anything I want to do and I'm still saved and you know, I'm under grace and it doesn't matter and I'm pre-forgiven and all these things. And really what you're doing is you're not reproving the uh, unfruitful works of darkness. You're having koinonia with them. And the Bible tells you not to. We're not to partake. We're not to share. We're not to have communion with these things. Can I get an amen out there? Hallelujah. And then in Philippians chapter 3. Oh, by the way, guys, I do see your little hearts when they fly across the screen. That is that is showing up. So I, I, I'll, I'll take some hearts and some hand claps and whatever. Philippians chapter 3. And verse 10, we'll actually go back at the verse 9. And being found, and be and in, be found in him, uh, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Hallelujah. That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. That if any means, if any means, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, notice, he wanted to share in. He wanted to uh, have communion with. He wanted to be in commonness with his death, and you have to. We have to accept the work of Christ, where He identified with us in in in, in a sin and then died for our sin. See, we, we, we have that fellowship of his sufferings. We share in it. But we share in his resurrection also. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. And you see, the gospel is not um, that everything is lovely. The gospel is everything was a mess. God sent Jesus. Jesus redeemed us. And when we accept that by faith and act on that in faith, then we get to share in the fellowship of his resurrection, of his life. Amen. He, we had, we, he had koinonia with our sufferings. So we share that. We have communion with that so that we can have communion with the resurrection. Ha, glory to God, hallelujah. There's the good news. Amen? I said, there's the good news. Praise be to God. And so fellowship is an essential part of the uh, mission of the church. We're, we're to have evangelization. We're to have the unifying around the doctrine of the, uh, of the church. We're to have fellowship. And that's, that's more than going to Longhorn together, which is great. I said, that's great. But it's got to be deeper than that. There has to be a depth to it that goes into the spiritual side where we are, we're, we're, and we're not trying to, oh, yeah, I'm going to minister to you today and, you know, get real warm. We got God here today and the spirit. No, but we are ministering one to another out of the abundance of life that's in us and we share and have communion with that life and we minister, have koinonia, one with another in the church. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Another thing um, that, that was the mission of the church, now they said in, in, in our scripture in Acts 2.42, uh, participation in daily prayers. Now I understand you know, um, in that culture, they would go pray daily, uh, corporately. Um, that, that, that even, even in other religions, they do that. You know, there's a time of day that they would get together and they would pray corporately. And so they would participate in that, though, together. There was corporate prayer. And then that's, that's really what we could, we could, we could kind of label it along this line instead of participating Everybody getting together every day. We could, but we we do participate in corporate prayer. Acts one fourteen, um, Bible says these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary and the the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Hallelujah! Look at Acts chapter uh, four. 
Acts chapter 4, starting verse 23. It says, And being let go, they went to their own company. And, um, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in, uh, that, that in them is. <laughs> Sounds like Yoda. Okay. And all them that in them is. <laughs> Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. And of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined beforehand to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, when they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Hallelujah. And so the corporate prayer, the coming together, Okay, but one that puts a thousand in flight, two puts ten thousand in flight, and that is an exponential um, increase in power. So the more we get together, and we're in unity, and we're in harmony, and we're in oneness, and we're in communion one with the other and with the Lord, the more power is available into what we're doing and praying. So much so, it shook the building, shook it up. Hallelujah! I I I'd like to see some building shaking services. Glory to God! Can you say Amen? Praise the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 4. The disciples were, you know, the apostles were being pressured because the, the Grecian uh, women were being neglected in the uh, daily administration. And they, they got together and said, here, you pick, get some guys, you choose them out. And verse 4, but we would give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. There's an important aspect of prayer that cannot be understated. It is vital and valuable to the function of the church. And the church praying is an effective tool. Now, we can complain about everything on the planet, and we can be right, but we must be praying. Amen? Not a griping session with God. Prayer. Lord, behold their threatenings. Stretch forth your hand to heal. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, Lord, this is what's going on. Do this. Hallelujah. We have to give ourselves to prayer. And we let, let the Lord work through us, pray through us. Well, I don't know what to pray about. And the Spirit takes hold together with us against our weaknesses. For we know not how to pray as we ought. Hallelujah. Amen. I said amen, but then we pray with um, utterances that cannot be understood. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray utterances um, not in articulate speech. Glory to God. All right. Look at Romans 12, 12. The book of Romans, chapter 12. Looking down in verse 12. So Paul writes, says, rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Be ready to pray. There's going to be times that we got, we got, we got to be, okay, we got to pray. We got to be able to pray right now. Amen. You don't have time to get it out the holy water and, you know, get your picture of Jesus and light the candles and get all around there and get in the ooh mode. You got to be able to be instant in prayer. And then we understand that our prayer is communing with the Father and bringing, well, worshiping God, that's part of prayer, but also bringing requests before the throne of God. Uh, we don't have to have a certain atmospheric condition in order to do that. We create that atmospheric, spiritually, condition by being in koinonia, 
being in fellowship. Amen? Hallelujah. See, when you're in fellowship, having, com ha having communion, having sharing, having commonity, then it doesn't take a whole lot to be able to go into instant prayer. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, Ephesians 6.18. And we know what that we should know what that says by now. And um, it really helped me. If I, I was wondering why that's not it, I was in Galatians. I, I knew it wasn't right. I'm like I, I, know, I know what Ephesians six eighteen says: praying always with all prayer and supplication. Amplified Bible says all manner of prayer. Praying always with all manner of prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there into it all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we are as the church to be given to praying all manner of prayer. There's going to be times that we need to intercede. There are going to be times that we need to um, um, supplicate. There'll be times we need to you know, use the prayer of authority, binding and loosing. There's there's all types of prayer that, but that we need to be versed in so that in the in, when we need to be instant in prayer we can step into that and pray along the lines that are necessary and be effective but the church was continued daily in prayer in other words they they corporately pray um it doesn't do any good to say well we got a prayer chain and then we we call you up you go well i ain't prayed in six months i ain't really in the you know i ain't really in the flow there brother you know, we we need to be instant. We need to be instant in prayer. We need to be versed in prayer. We need to be in attitudes of prayer, um, and we need to have corporate prayer. Now we do that on Tuesday nights. If you haven't joined us yet, it's available. We come together and we pray. We're doing it virtual right now, but um, <clears throat> we come together and we pray in a Zoom meeting. A little bit different than than what I'm doing, where I'm I'm, minister, I'm, I'm teaching or ministering or preaching. Um, and streaming, and it's coming in on your end, but you're not, you 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 can't really in, interact back. I mean, I, you can give a heart, and you can say praise the Lord, but you can't really verbally and whatever. Our Zoom meeting is set up where you can interact, where we can, or we're all praying together, we're hearing one another, we're there together, okay? And so I, I encourage, if you haven't been, to, to uh, begin making efforts to join us for that. It would be good. You would be blessed by it. <clears throat> Amen? Those that, that are out there that come, uh, you can see a few hearts across the screen. We'll be we'll be happy to have your confirmation. Glory to God, Amen. Look, if you will, into Colossians the fourth chapter. Colossians chapter four, verse two. Paul writes and says, "Continue in prayer, watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us." that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in bonds. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So it's so important that we, you know, continue in prayer. Not just, oh, we had a prayer service back in 19, you know, 99, and, you know, we've got together and prayed and we, we believe God. Well, great. But that was 99. This is 21, 21. That's 22 years ago. We need to be praying. Content, we need to be continuing today. Or oh, we prayed three weeks ago. Well, that's great. But we need to be praying today. Um, it's it's not enough to, to kind of like visit this as a, we had a prayer seminar. We all got together and prayed this week. And hallelujah. Oh, it was so powerful. We all had a good time. And now let's go to the faith seminar. And let's go to the prosperity seminar. Now we need to be continuing in prayer. We need to be continuing in prayer and watch in that and watch what in that continued prayer with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, um, make you know, remember, make with thanksgiving, but through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Looking at verse 25. Paul writes, says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see 
the day approaching. Now, didn't say anything about prayer here, but um, he's talking about assembling together. See, when we assemble together, um, we, purpose can be to uh, worship, have, have koinonia, hear the word, also prayer, coming together. In our, in our meeting time, one with another. And this, you can't kind of go back and this kind of keeps going back to that koinonia thing where we're all having, you know, communion one with another. A communion with the Lord, communion with one another. Um, sharing, partaking, okay? And in that place, there's going to be worship. There's going to be praise. There's going to be the breaking of the bread of life. There's going to be um, prayer. And it's, it's so important that that's where we function and exist. And, but these are aspects of the church. Church, we, we've made so much of church a, a social aspect. And, and I get that there's a social aspect to the church. But that must be the outgrowth of the spiritual aspect of the church and not the other way around. So often we try to have a real, real um, um, social aspect to the church, so much so that it supersedes the spiritual function. Um, and people like to come because, you know, they, they've made friends, and they like to come because, you know, they, they see some pretty cool rock and music over there. And um, they get that, that little, you know, encouraging word from the, um, the lead pastor, okay, and all these different things, and that becomes, and, and then what, what's being hoped is that somehow out of that, the outgrowth will be they'll convert spiritually, when the truth of the matter is that it, it should be the saints coming together in communion, partaking and sharing uh, in, in the fellowship of Christ and of the Father, and out of that, there is a growth of um, the social aspect. It's grow, it grows out of the spiritual communion and not the other way around. Okay? Um, the church is the house of the believers. The church is the gathering of the saints. And uh, let's not confuse that. Let's not get that. Um, we're, try, we're trying to do it the other way. You know? Let's be real carnal and they'll come and then maybe somewhere in there we can get them to Christ. That's not the message they preach in the Bible. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And then they got them in, and then they began to have the community of believers and the fellowship and the, the koinonia, and then out of that spiritual relationship and fellowship with Christ, with the Father, with one another, the body, um, then grew out of that um, social aspects. But the social aspects didn't produce the spiritual, the spiritual, spiritual. See, this man is spiritual. We have to start with the highest part of man. Well, it all makes sense to me to do it the other way. Well, okay. But that's not how it was done in the Bible. That's not how they did it. They got him saved. And they, they focused. Remember back? They evangelized. They, they stayed the unity uh, around the doctrine of the church. Then they entered into Koinonia fellowship. Now what? They're, they're, they're praying together. Well, they, they not only have our fellowship and communion with Christ, now they are uh, using that fellowship and that position to make requests and behest at the throne of God to, be, to uh, make to, to build and to spread the kingdom of God in the earth. Glory. Hallelujah. In Jude 20. Hallelujah. Little old Jude. It is not the Beatles song, by the way. <laughs> Actually, it's rumored that that was really a British euphorism for um, heroin. That heroin was the answer. Which would be terrible. Y'all here, you gone home. Y'all out there? All right. 
Jude 20. It says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Ma'am, let's, let's build together. Let's come together and pray together. And, um, you know, participate one with another in prayer. Glory to God. Amen. The next thing that the church did, and, and guys, I may, I may, I may, I may um, get done, but I don't, I don't know. There's one more point after this, but I don't know that I would do it justice to um, try to get that in tonight. Um, they broke bread together. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. They were constantly receiving together the Lord's table. They were breaking bread, not just eating together. They say sometimes we, because remember he, he, in this same chapter, he rebukes them for coming together in the church and all getting over here and eating this big feast and eating together while the bunch over here in the corner is suffering and, and doing without food. And you're over there, you know, getting wasted and, 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 and filling up on your food. And, you know, you know, the breaking of the bread was to com was that sharing of the communion of the body and blood of the Lord. And so they were constantly reminding themselves of the essence and the essential, the essential central theme of the church, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. And uh, over in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Okay? And so here we have it. They came together to break bread, to fellowship around the redemptive of communion. That's why one reason that we begin to refer to the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, receiving the Passover as communion, because we were entering into communion with Christ in relationship to his death, burial, and resurrection, the redemptive work of Christ by being reminded the blood and the, the, the blood and the body of Christ were broken and spilled to redeem us physically and spiritually, and that we as a corporate body joined together in remembrance of that, and then he broke the bread of life, preached to him. Hallelujah. And so we have to be reminded that we are to be, we need to have communion. Now, there's no set amount of time you need to have, have uh, and listen, all the terms, Holy Communion, the Eucharist, um, communion, um, whatever you know, other terms people may use. It's referring to the breaking of bread, the referring to the the meal instituted by Christ and changing the Passover from the celebration of Israel coming out of Egypt to the uh, humanity coming out of the kingdom of darkness by His blood and by His body. Hallelujah! And now we have the we have communion, we have the Holy Eucharist, we have the Lord's table. Hallelujah. And we break bread together. Can you say amen? Acts 20, 11. Uh, when, he there too, when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the day he departed. Glory to God. Now this is after they, remember they raised this guy from the dead because Paul got to preach for a long time. I guess he went and had communion again. Broke bread again. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, there is nothing wrong with fellowshipping or breaking bread and having a meal, but the emphasis was on the table of the Lord. Now listen, you come to my house and have dinner, 
Um, a lot of times if we have time to prepare, when Bill, we love to cook is chicken cordon bleu. And uh, we, we pound the chicken breast out. We, you know, hand bread it and roll it and, and bake it and make the sauce and all that. And it's, it is slap your mama good. Hallelujah. I almost make me want to have some right down. Glory to God, Jesus. It's a good meal. Hallelujah. But, um, you know, that's great. And that's fine. And if you came in, we had you come over and we, we had that. And we just hung out together. That's all great. That's fine. But the emphasis in the church was for them to break bread together, to commune around Christ, particularly gathering together in large groups to do this, being reminded of our common thread, Christ is in us. Amen. These things are all reminders. And it builds strength because it reminds us that I'm not alone. I've got you. And you're not alone. You've got me. And then we've got somebody else. And the three of us have this one. And then the four of us, all of a sudden, this thing expands to there's a strength where we are supplying and ministering one to another out of this relationship, fellowship, koinonia, breaking of bread, praying together, a, a, a harm, harm, harmony begins to flourish in our midst that empowers us. Hallelujah. They were in one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. The power of unity when they were trying to build the Tower of Babel, God said that if he didn't confound the language, nothing would be withheld from them. And they wouldn't be able to be stopped because of their unity. And these things, the mission of the church is to create that so that we are a power packed, anointed organism called the church functioning in the earth that is like the blob uh, from the old Steve McQueen horror movie back in the 50s that we uh, are, are, according to Star Trek, the Borg, where we're assimilating everybody in. You know, the blob would get on them and they would all become part of the blob. We're, we're supposed to be coming, get, getting on people and they become part of Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, look over, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 10. And I, I'm going to go ahead and just say it. We're not going to finish. I can't do the next part tonight. So next week we'll do that. And then the following week, okay? Because I will be able to finish the one next week. Uh, next week. The following week we'll be, we will begin the Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon. Uh, glory to God. We'll, we'll begin in that uh, the following week. First Corinthians chapter 10, looking down into verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, it is not the communion of the blood. Of, is it not? the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one body and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. This constant reminder of the harmonious oneness relationship of the body of Christ Jesus himself being the head is vital to our ability to function and to expand the kingdom and to protect one another from ravening wolves and evil men who want to creep in unawares and, and bring disruption. We need the breaking of bread together and being in harmony one with another. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. The next chapter in verse 20, Paul writes, when you're come together in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. See, this is where he's rebuking them for their, their, their focus was to come together and eat and drink. And he's not happy with them. And I say he is not happy. And Paul didn't have a problem letting them know he wasn't happy. I would I, I sometimes often wonder 
What would it be like if the Apostle Paul showed up in a lot of our churches today and walked in and observed for a little while and then they asked him to get up and speak? I, I, I just wonder what that would be like. You know, with, uh, you know, homosexuals um, leading the worship and lesbians out in the congregation and um, pedophiles sitting over here on this side and um, drug dealers over here and they're, they're the ushers. I'm just wondering how Paul would handle that. I don't really wonder. I know how you handle it. Amen. There should be Without condemnation, without us getting up and, and telling, you know, you dirty, rotten dog, sinner, you're going to hell. Such a, a harmony around Christ that unbelievers and those living in sin cannot um, stand staying in that presence in a, in a non-repentant way. They just, they, they can't do it. Instead of stroking them and telling them they're okay and we accept your lifestyle. We're going to marry you. You know, you, you have to answer to God for that one, buddy. Um, I just, I can't, I, I know Paul would not put up with this stuff. And so, uh, here he, 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 he rebukes them. I mean, he's not happy with how they conducted themselves here. And, um, you know, uh, where was that? Okay, for when you come together, there is in one place, this is not the Lord's Supper. For in, the, in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry and another is drunken. In other words, you guys are over here and you brought in all this food for you and your pals. And then you got the people over here who don't have much. And they're over there, they're starving. And you're over here uh, pigging out and getting drunk in church. What? What? This is Paul's rhetor rhetorical nature. Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise you the church of God and bring shame and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Let me put that in modern day English. You want me to condone that? You've got to be kidding me. Hello? Thank you. Uh, for I have received of the Lord that which I delivered. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now stop. What do you mean? You show the Lord's death. You are reminded what it's all about. It's about the price Jesus paid to take every sinner, every lost person, and grant them access to the very presence of God and to the family of God and to the body of Christ, regardless of stature, regardless of, of socioeconomic standards, regardless of race, regardless of any of that stuff. Jesus made a way where there was no way. And his heart is for all to have fellowship, koinonia, one with another. And the breaking of bread is that constant reminder of his heart. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Um, Revelation chapter 12. I got two more verses, and then we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to wrap for the night. Revelation chapter 12. There's sometimes we're doing Bible study, I think, man, I, I remember the old days when we, we always, we uh, we taught from the pulpit every service and, and we're going to get back there because this, this thing just can't last forever. And um, this will be one of them wind it up and preach it verses when, you know, you get here, you just can't stop anymore. Uh, they overcame him. That means the devil, the, the evil one. By the blood of the lamb, and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. That communion, that fellowship, that breaking of bread, is a constant reminder of the communion that Jesus shed his blood and redeemed us by his own blood <clears throat> out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. 
Hallelujah. And let's wrap up in, in Hebrews chapter 9. My favorite passage in the Bible. Hallelujah. I mean, I could just, you know, read this and go to preaching. Hallelujah. But Christ being a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building or not of this earth, neither by the blood of bulls and of goats and of calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into that holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hallelujah. That breaking of bread is the reminder that he entered in once and for all with his own blood. And he obtained redemption, but not just redemption, eternal redemption for us. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Can you say amen? The breaking of bread is important. And seeing it more than, than as a church ritual or sacrament but seeing it as a vital aspect of the mission of the church to keep us center-focused on Christ in us, the hope of glory. I want to thank you for joining me tonight. We sure love you guys. You're a blessing. and uh, When we don't get to see you in person, we miss you. But we sure are glad that we get to see you pop up on the on our feeds and know that you've joined together with us, at least virtually, uh, and have been able to uh, partake together of that which the Lord has to say. So we bless your households. We bless your lives. We speak um, un, um, abundant favor over you now in Jesus' name. Until we meet again next time, I want you to remember these words. Oh, before I do that, don't forget, two weeks from tonight, two weeks, everybody say, two weeks, we begin the Bible in the light of our redemption by E.W. Kenyon. Next week, we got to finish this up. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and this last point, I just did not want to leave it uh, short. Okay? So we'll just, we'll just go ahead and push that off one more week. It's okay. Amen. 37 weeks are coming of it. So pushing off a week is not going to hurt us. Okay? Because I, I, I do want to finish this uh, mission of the church uh, and do it justice. Glory to God. But I do want to tell you, we, again, we love you. God bless you. And remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. See you next time here. Faith and Victory Church, on site and online. Good night, everybody.